Eden has been here for 20 years now. And um, Tim will be speaking in a minute. And Tim and I have been here for 20 years as well, actually, as we worked out the other day. And we have a passion to look after the planet, which looks after us, as you all do here today. So we're with, we're with like-minded friends. We're a living theater of plants and people. And we don't just bring people to Eden who care about the environment, who care about the creatures in the environment and who care about the planet as a whole. We aim to connect with the disconnected as well. So we work with scientists all over the world and then here we work with scientists, communicators, artists, designers to help to communicate their work in a whole range of different ways. If you have time today, you probably won't because it's such a packed day, so come back another day if you can't today. Have a, have a look around the site and see some of the artworks and the exhibits and the projects that we're working on. This afternoon there is an opportunity to have a close look at one of our exhibitions. Andrew Brown came to me with an idea for a little exhibition. Thanks, Andrew. Here is Andrew Brown, without whom we would not be here. <laughs> Thank you. Nick Bentham Green um, sadly can't be uh, with us today. Um, uh, he's chairman of BIBA and B4 and was going to be chairing the meeting today. Sadly, his mother is gravely, well, very, 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 very ill. Um, it's a shame he can't see what we've achieved um, today. Um, it was much due to his strategic thinking that we got to where we got to. Yesterday, we got academics from the British Isles together uh, in, uh, in, a, 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 in a conflab, and they've agreed to work together so uh, on the dark uh, uh, native honeybee, uh, and, uh, and that is uh, amazing. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Sir Tim Smith, um, we need leaders uh, with gentle patronage who keep lots of important projects fired up, and Tim's our man. <laughs> Hello, everybody, and welcome to Eden. It's really nice to know that we have a room full of self-selecting activists which is terrific. It, it's very funny. I, I, I think a lot about the issue about why does our planet seem to go to hell in a handcart. And the more I think about it, the more I realize it's as if we've all got Stockholm Syndrome, as if everybody expects somebody else to do something. It's extraordinary, this bystander, stu bystander stuff. And there was an article in um, the Lo it sounds a bit poncy me saying this, but in the London Review of Books, a, a psychological, a book about the psychology of, of masses, which says that if you have four or five people in a railway carriage and someone starts an act of violence, always someone will get up and intervene and it will be stopped. You get a carriage that's absolutely packed and someone starts to be violent and no one intervenes. Isn't that odd? It's very odd. And I, I would have thought this was a bit of made up stuff. And I thought back to my youth when I um, used to go to a lot of rock festivals. And I remember being at a rock festival in Rotterdam where I saw 10 Hells Angels terrify probably around eight, 9,000 people, simply because good people didn't know that if they stood forward, everybody else who was good would step forward, in which case these things wouldn't happen. Part of the problem also seems to be that we're polite. Well, I, I'm assuming, I haven't met you all, haven't had that pleasure, but I'm assuming that you are all on the sort of polite side of the spectrum. And there's a sort of point at which you have to ask yourself, at what point do you stop being polite? And at what point do you actually become more strident? I remember Oscar Wilde once famously said, no one remembers the well-mannered person at a party, which I think the Stones took to heart. Um, <laughs> it's a great bit of brand movement, isn't it? Um, but I'm very serious about this because the, the Natural History Museum, for example, um, 18 months ago did a survey of, for a whole day of the people coming into the Natural History Museum, and they found that 85% of the people that came in Bear in mind, they'd chosen to come to a place called the Natural History Museum. 85% of them did not know the meaning of the word biodiversity. 85%! You'd think I was making this up, wouldn't you? It may be our problem, maybe we should stop having jargon of any kind and just call it variety of life and be done with it. You know, because there are times when we do get sort of hung up. I mean, look at Andrew torturing himself. Is it the dark native honeybee? Is it the European? It's this brand thing, isn't it? 
It's a bee. It's black. It lives around here. And it's really well adapted. And I'm really proud to be its patron. Um, well, one of its patrons. Uh, but th the reason I wanted to s uh, sort of welcome you here was because we've gone through a bit of a long night of the soul at Eden ourselves. We, obviously, we've been here 20 years, and everybody tells you all sorts of nice things. You're so wonderful. You're so terrific. You know, oh, how visionary you are. Oh, really? Really? The actual real measure, if you're not living in the 21st century where everybody tells everybody they're wonderful and it's all marketing sh stuff, right? is you've got to ask yourself if any of the world's great scientific institutions were even 20% as good as they claim to be, would we be in this mess? And we wouldn't, because by and large, most scientists are crap. Utterly, utterly a waste of space when it comes to championing the importance. Look, a lot of my friends are scientists, but they're trying to get over it. You know, it's a... It's a um, but this is a serious point. It's a serious point. The whole way we have set up grants for this, or you know, the way NERC do their grants for big science, it's always to do with some kind of theoretical thing. And they have this thing called impact, where you measure how many people have been persuaded, how many, you know. You get the same nonsense. For example, if I was to ask all of you a question, we're all the boss of the Arts Council right now. Should we be judging whether we're going to give some money to a play on the basis whether a thousand people are going to be modestly amused on a dark night in Bradford or are 70 people not going to kill themselves because it was so impactful? How do you balance that? And I just feel that part of the problem with the way we all are is where we're interested, obviously, in, in, in bees or else you, you wouldn't be here. But it is at a certain point, when is enough enough and we get angry about the way the world is. Now, Eden, we've decided actually rather abruptly, it's a bit like cold water going down on top of our heads, that we have lied to ourselves. For 20 years, we've lied to ourselves in some senses about our impact. It's called education by stealth. We are not going to tell people what to do. You find it out. You discover it. The British don't like to be told. You know they don't like to be told. The amount of letters I have written to people who've written to me by saying, um, why do you not have a list of the ten top things to do to save the world as you leave Eden? And I always reply, because nobody reads them and nobody likes to be told how to save the world. And also, the other thing is that we, people who are activists always use the word change. Isn't it amazing? The word change is the second most loathed word in the English language after discharge. <laughs> no, but isn't that odd that we always want to change the world? Why? And we always want to get out of our comfort zone. Why? It's a comfort zone. We want to be in it. Therefore, if we actually want to be in comfort zones and we want to change the world, we've got to be really careful that in our comfort zone we don't hold on to quite a lot of very damaging stuff. When I started restoring the Lost Gardens of Heligan, everybody was really cross with me because I was changing things that weren't done by the National Trust. Because the National Trust, they who are gods, they who are populated by largely a huge amount of people who wished they lived in the houses that they were protecting, <laughs> right? They believe the past is somehow a better place, a place which smelt of fresh baked bread, where lovely wood smoke billowed out of every chimney and people were at one with nature. It's a lie. It's like the Blitz spirit. You go and talk to some people who lived in the Blitz, they will not talk to you about the Blitz spirit. When you talk to people who were making up the story of the Bram Britain in the 1950s and 60s, it's them who talk about the Blitz spirit. So when we talk about all things bright and beautiful and our countryside and meadows, and we've got the National Wildflower Centre here, don't you know? It's really easy to fall into the Daily Mail evil Wow, we've got wildflowers. Let's plant them everywhere. They're really beautiful. It's a bit like starting a health service and saying we're only going to do cosmetic surgery. It is. What lies at the heart of the work that you're all engaged with is something fundamental. It's not lifestyle choice. It's not designer. It's actually about trying to preserve the foundations of that which we call biodiversity in which Bees are a part, but they are incredibly important to us. Let's be honest. I know we're all fans of bees, but it's a bit like someone gave us a pet panda. I mean, if we were actually really, really keen on bacteria or streptococcus, it's a really hard thing to get like a bunch of you all, all one night for a streptococcus event, isn't it? Bees, though, bees are cool. 
And I think the we've got to be very aware that we have a private kind of dialogue about the preservation, conservation, a new vision for bees. And that's the other thing, that's the last thing I want to finish on, is the past wasn't a better place. Nature wasn't better in the past at some neutral point. It was always dynamic. It was always explosive. It is trouble that the human condition always wants to make it belie you believe that history is just linear. It goes on like that. And yet everything is about massive, shocking change. Everything that's influenced your lives was not linear. You have no idea how weird it is to feel as if you are in an entire country that is suffering a mental health issue. Right? I'll give you an example. Do you remember 2008, 2009? The banks. Do you remember that? We were told we were going to recession. As soon as the banks. But the banks screwed up, didn't they? They were corrupt. They were evil. And then and everybody said, we didn't see that coming. We really didn't see that coming. I thought you were a profession. That's different. Isn't it interesting? I don't know how many of you have the misfortune to socialize with bankers. I do. And some of them are very nice. But you know the weirdest thing? Every single one of them today claims they saw it coming. It's the human condition. We rewrite the past always to make it look as if we were in control when in fact no one saw the VHS coming, no one saw CDs coming, no one saw the advent of computers in your house, no one saw the smartphone coming. Only 10 years, 11 years ago the smartphone came. And yet now we always claim it was a linear thing. It's the same when you find people in my age now talking about electric cars. Oh, by 2040. In three years! Us middle-aged people are so dangerous because we lie to ourselves all the time about history and history isn't the way you say it is. That is why it is really important to realize that that thing that was said, uh, rumored, it was rumored at the time of Ceausescu in Romania where they were getting shot at by Ceausescu's guards and they then decided to keep the rebellion going and they sent around the paper which said, if not us, who? If not now, when? The issue of saving biodiversity is utterly critical. And we could just be polite and go back and make jam and look after our bees and we'll actually talk about a little honey project over here and an apple orchard project over there. Or we could also pledge ourselves to being really, really angry that we're creating a system in which we are not penalizing people who are damaging the common wealth. I want you to think about this. When at the dawning of the Renaissance, right? The dawning of the Renaissance. Do you think a whole bunch of people knew that they were at the start of a Renaissance? Hey guys, I think it's Renaissance time now. You know, we see that thing coming. Or the Age of Enlightenment. I can see it now. Wow! We're so enlightened. This is really cool. Well done, oh Descartes. You, you really are. So, if we were looking at the ceiling right now, and you saw etched onto the ceiling your descendants 100 years from now, looking down, how amazing would it be if they were saying, well done, you did nothing. That was really good. That was really enlightened. That kind of passive somebody, they will do it. One of the really amazing things about that banking crisis, which may sound not at all about bees, but one of the amazing things about the banking crisis is how many people that are in positions of authority have suddenly realized that something they believed all their lives is not true. There is no they. They died years ago. There's only us. And actually the conceit that there is somehow a they that will protect us, there's some godlike figure that will uh, uh, create some legislation, is a myth that keeps us mute because it's somebody else. So we're just as guilty of being these passive observers as the other people we think do so much damage. I'm sorry for making this just a little bit of a polemic, but one of the things we've done at Eden is to, re to this, just this last three months, is we've realized we've got to stop lying to ourselves about gentle education by stealth. I wonder whether we can get this into the curriculum. Have you noticed how middle-aged people always want to inflict education on the young? You know, I love that when the Prime Minister said those kids shouldn't go on strike yesterday. <laughs> they shouldn't go on strike, they should be getting a schooling. I say, go on strike, mate, because by the time it's time for you to get a job, there may be no planet. And the trouble is, that used to be considered left-wing fighting talk. 
I think the world of politics, what they could not deal with would be the whole bunch of people like us got cross. Because the real strength of people like us is that we are not definable as being left-wing or right-wing or you know, having this kind of shtick. We're people who just care. We're people who understand beauty, joy, and the buzzing of the countryside, not just in terms of the, the joke words on, on bees, but in terms of the health of the countryside. I doubt there's a single person in this room who doesn't feel the strange paradox of disappointment that their windscreen isn't splattered with insects. Isn't that the weirdest feeling? I'm so sad I haven't killed a thousand insects. You know, This is actually an existential crisis. And at what point are the people who live in cities who, for them, the countryside is something in the children's books for their kids in the bath. At what point are we going to actually make a point and regularly beat on about this? That's all I wanted to say, really. That was a bit of a rant, wasn't it? I, 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 it's terribly indulgent of me to do it. But basically, having a whole bunch of people pinioned to the green chairs, not knowing, not knowing what's going to happen next, um, is a tremendous opportunity never to be missed. So enjoy the day. Please look in the mirror and wonder whether now is the time to find the inner activist in yourself. Because wouldn't it be cool if we all became activists that no one could actually pin down as to what it is we're active about, except that we care for the natural world. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tim. All right, the first uh, subject up um, this morning is Honeybee Genetics and Adaption. And we're lucky enough and privileged to have uh, three members from Plymouth University, Dr. Maori Knight, Dr. John Ellis, and Victoria Buswell. Thank you very much. Oh, yeah. I think the, the challenge for today will be uh, not falling off this stage. <laughs> Um, uh, many, many thanks. And, um, my name is Mary Knight. I'm from the University of Plymouth, so I'm one of those these uh, crap scientists that uh, Tim has just uh, introduced. I'm, I'm not going to say very much. I just wanted to stand up and um, uh, before we've obviously got a morning of uh, talks updating on where we are with some of the research around um, honeybees in the uh, UK and Ireland. Um, what this conference has allowed us to do is yesterday to meet as a group of academics for the first time, um, it get ourselves in the same room and um, start talking about the kinds of research that we're doing and how we might work together more effectively as a, as a group moving forward. We were, really, we're really fortunate the way this has happened, so we've got um, our group at the University of Plymouth, we've got uh, Paul Cross and Anita and Dylan who are here uh, from the University of Bangor, We've got Mark and Rachel down from the Rosalind Inst Institute in Edinburgh, and we've got Grace, who's talking later from uh, Galway in Ireland. So we've got fantastic representation across the whole of the British Isles in terms of interests, academic interests in uh, honeybees. Um, our meeting was, as I said, highly positive, and I just wanted to kind of uh, finish on three key things I think that came out of that meeting. The first, of the, first, first thing, and really importantly, and I guess um, um, following on from the, 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 the importance that Tim stresses about us starting to work more effectively together, was launching um, a, a, a semi-formal research collaborative network where we can share ideas across the UK and Ireland and hopefully start working together on broader um, projects across the British Isles so that we can get a more uh, coherent view um, using um, shared techniques so that we can get a more coherent view of what's happening to the diversity of honeybees in the UK and Ireland. Um, we're also um, working towards a joint article where we can summarise where we are with research in this area that we would plan to be um, working towards an article, a scientific uh, uh, article but as well as articles for the beekeeping press. And finally, and perhaps most importantly, and again aligning with the themes that uh, Tim, Tim was highlighting, um, is this has got to be a partnership. So as a group of interested academics, obviously we're interested in, uh, in, in research in this area, 
But it's critical that we work together with uh, you as a community of beekeepers and through organisations such as uh, BEBA and um, um, Irish organisations before and so on to help to try to inform and organise together uh, what the key actions are in terms of both conserving what our native biodiversity in terms of honeybees is, but also to secure uh, healthy and well-adapted uh, honeybee populations across the UK and Ireland for future generations. I'm going to introduce John Ellis, who's going to kick off the day with a talk, um, trying to answer some of the basic questions, I think, that have come forward from, through Andrew about what people might want to know about in terms of um, studies around genetics, um, the genetics of um, honeybees. So, uh, good morning, everyone. Yeah, my name's John Ellis. I'm from the University of Plymouth. It's a privilege to be invited to speak to you again today. Um, just to say a bit about my lecture in conservation genetics there. Um, I'm a molecular ecologist. It means I apply genetic techniques to study natural populations. And mostly in the past, I've worked on bumblebees and also fish. But more recently, I began to work on honeybees when Andrew Brown and the B4 organization approached Plymouth University for some advice, seeking to analyze uh, some genetic data investigating hybridization, introgression, admixture in uh, local honeybee populations. And that's when we began to work on honeybees in our molecular ecology group at Plymouth University. And the purpose of this first talk today is to try and answer your questions about honeybees and genetics. So we put a call out to pick up questions from beekeepers of what you'd like to know about genetics. And we received back several very good and also quite challenging questions to address. <clears throat> some of the questions are, are very good and they get right to the core of some important issues in conservation biology. Um, it's obviously going to be difficult to address them in, in depth without you doing um, like an undergraduate course in, in genetics, which obviously there isn't time for in 20 minutes. Well, I can say we offer very many excellent degree programs at Plymouth University. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, you can enroll. Um, so what I'll do is I'll just go through the questions in turn and I'll uh, answer them. I'll try and answer them in a straightforward way that doesn't use too much uh, jargon because there can be a lot of jargon involved in genetics. Obviously, I'll just be giving a surface level to the answers, and if you want to ask more questions, please do so in the break. Oh, is this working? So the first question we had is, um, what genetic tools are available to beekeepers? What do they achieve, and how much do they cost? I thought, first of all, just to answer this question, approach it from the kind of genetic tools that are available to uh, molecular ecologists nowadays, uh, population geneticists. And the first thing I wanted to emphasize is that today is a really, really exciting time to be working in genetics, because all of the technological advances that are coming through for human health and medicine, we can apply many of those genetic te techniques to study in natural populations. And there's been a real rapid revolution in the technology that underlies genetic techniques that we can use um, in the lab. And that's changed a lot even since I did my uh, PhD, which was about, uh, finished about 13 years ago. In the last 10 years especially, there's been very rapid change. And um, basically, we can use techniques that look at um, phylogeny, which is, means recreating the evolutionary, uh, trying to seek to represent the evolutionary relationships between taxa. And we can do that with relatively few what we call genetic markers. So looking at just a small selection of genes, we can try and recreate the evolutionary relationships between taxa. We can also look uh, more at um, things where we use techniques that try and understand the genetic basis of particular traits, and that involves using more of the, the genome information to answer those kinds of questions. And finally, natural selection leaves traces in the genome of organisms that you can detect to try and uh, infer particular patterns of selection that organisms have been subjected to. And uh, we can investigate those kinds of questions today in natural populations, but that takes more, um, a bigger fraction of the genome, and it's uh, more expensive. 
So basically these techniques go from being quite cheap, five pounds a sample, to maybe get some DNA sequence data, up to much more expensive, a few hundred pounds a sample, uh, to sequence um, more of the genome. But those methods that, uh, that sequence more of the genome, they involve a lot of bioinformatic techniques that are quite difficult and quite challenging and you need maybe a postdoctoral researcher or a PhD student to analyze the data so it's more expensive and more challenging than just sending off uh, a sample and getting data back. So some of you might be aware of uh, organizations now like 23andMe which is a company that you can use to uh, detect your own ancestry and look at whether you've inherited particular genes that make you um, more likely to have certain disease traits. So I did that recently myself because in my family my mum had a hypothesis that my father's grandma was really a prostitute <laughs> and my, my, my father's granddad was an Italian pimp and my real name should be Orsini and not Alice. Maybe she's been reading too many cheap uh, romantic novels. My dad thought this was just salacious gossip. So I investigated my ancestry using the genetic techniques. And I'm pleased to say for those reasons that I don't have any Southern European ancestry. My great grandma was a, a fine and honorable woman. Uh, also, when you do those tests, you can get your uh, genetic data back and you can get a good picture of your own ancestry and you can also, you need to be cautious with how you interpret the results but you can look at whether you've picked up any genes that are associated with particular diseases as well if you wish to do that. Um, we're not at that stage yet in honeybees where you can send off a sample and you can get quite complex genetic analyses done and then packaged back to you in a nice neat report that's easy to interpret. Um, but we are beginning to do the science that might allow those kind of things to take place in the, in the future using these modern genomic techniques. Oops, I've gone backwards. Uh, so what is available today though, there are some genetic services available for beekeepers that are more practical. So for example, in Switzerland, there's a company called Apigenics that's run by Gabrielle Soland. And she offers genetic hybrid tests, parentage tests, testing mating stations. And these tests are based on assigning your honeybee genotype to uh, reference samples of subspecies. You can work out what likelihood your B sample is to be um, from Apis mellifera, mellifera stock, mellifera ligusticus stock, mellifera carnica stock, and so on. Um, I don't know how much that costs actually, but Andrew Brown has used them uh, quite extensively, and he'll be able to tell you some more about the costs if you want that information. So there are these kinds of tests available, and that's just the, uh, one company that I'm uh, aware of. Our next question was, can we use current progress in other fields of molecular biology to predict advances in honeybee research? And the short answer to this question is, yes, we can. And as I've already alluded to, here on the left is a picture of massive parallel sequencing. That's the name for the techniques that arose over the last decade or so. I mean, we can get much more sequence data much more rapidly than we ever were able to in the, in the past. And it, it's really astounding the scale of development of genetic techniques because to sequence the first human genome it took about a decade. I don't know how much it cost in total, but maybe millions of dollars. And nowadays, you can sequence a uh, human genome much more rapidly. And when I Googled the latest cost, it was around about 1,400 US dollars. And it's a really incredible rate of development. So these techniques are also available to people that study natural populations of organisms, and we can begin to apply them to get a better handle on genetic questions, the kind of thing that Mark will be talking about more uh, later on today. And we can also nowadays invent little microfluidic devices. That you, the idea is you can use a handheld de device to answer simple genetic tests in, in the field, and those might well be able to be developed in the future for beekeeping research. So there's a lot of rapid technological development, and we would expect that for sure to filter down into um, honeybee research in the future. <clears throat> the next question is really quite a difficult question to answer, and it was, should we preserve southwest Apis mellifera mellifera, or introduce Apis mellifera mellifera lines from elsewhere in the UK, or um, should we... Um, 
in, even introduce foreign mellifera and mellifera? And the answer is it depends, and it depends on how large the population size of dark European honeybees is in the UK. Uh, this figure shows the uh, loss of genetic variation, genetic variation on the y-axis from high to low and over time. And it's well established that uh, pop as population sizes decrease, populations would lose genetic diversity. And in that case, you might want to introduce uh, other samples into the southwest. However, it also depends on the extent of local adaptation among UK populations of mellifera and mellifera and between the UK and European populations because if you introduce foreign genotypes it can disrupt the local adaptation that's naturally evolved in a population. So it's a balance between these two things that you'd want to seek to do in conservation, maintaining population size and maintaining local adaptation. People that are interested in the science of reintroduction and reintroducing organisms back into natural habitats considered these kinds of questions and you can do things like what work out can you source a population that shares genetic ancestry with the population that you want to investigate like finding an ancestry match or if that's not available can you seek uh, individuals from populations where there's a good match to the local environment so the individuals might show similar adaptations and if that's not possible you can look at uh, introducing uh, individuals from many sources that would maintain the potential for adaptive evolution to occur. And you'd want to seek an ancestry match first of all and then an envir environment match and if that's not possible try and maintain the adaptive potential of a, a population. So the answer is it depends. We don't really know the exact population size of mellifera and mellifera in the UK and we've not well established the degree of local adaptation in those populations and that's very much a part of Victoria Buswell's PhD and Victoria is addressing those questions. Um, so I'm sorry, I'm getting flagged by Jerry that I've only got two minutes left. I think we're a bit behind from Tim Smith's talk so I'll try and speed up but I've still got several questions to get through. Um, <coughs> so the next question was, is there any hope for native bee conservation in the face of extensive imports of commercial bees? What's the probability that we could find an open mated Apis mellifera mellifera queen that's still 90% mellifera mellifera? And the answer to that question is, again, it, it, it depends. It's, it's known from studies of other species, this paper is a study of guppies, that uh, in natural populations you can maintain locally adapted forms in the face of a gene flow dispersal from other populations but it depends on the strength of selection for particular traits in natural populations. So we've got these two forces, dispersal bringing in new uh, genetic variation and evolution in the local population maintaining the locally adapted forms. Uh, it is possible sometimes and it's been observed in natural populations and this kind of thing could take place for example in bees if there was some kind of assortative mating of uh, dark European honeybee queens with dark European honeybee males or better survival of dark European honeybee colonies in the wild but also if you want to manage a semi-domesticated species like honeybees you could have management like protected areas that Andrew is keen to set up around the Rain Peninsula in the southwest here uh, you could use selective breeding or maybe archive genetic variation in the future by cryopreservation, something that's known as frozen arcs. <coughs> I did, when I was researching this, I found that there is some evidence for assortative mating in honeybees. So uh, in mating swarms of mixed honeybee races, there have been some studies that show females preferentially inseminated by drones of their own race. And there are lots of, things of relatively understudied questions like whether females reject certain males, do males avoid queens of other races. And one of the interesting things that happens in mating of honeybees is that immediately after the mating in the oviducts of the female, the honeybees manage 200 million sperm, but only 4.7 million of those get stored within the spermatheca of the female. That's a ph phenomenon that's got uh, the name extreme sperm dumping, and that could potentially lead to uh, cryptic choice on the part of female honeybees, but how, if that occurs or not, I don't know if that's well established. And it's known from PhD research um, that free living colonies uh, are frequently highly intergressed, that means hybridized with the other introduced species in England. So again, the answer is don't really know, and 
PhD projects like Victoria's will try and get to the bottom of these kinds of questions. Um, next question, dangers and likelihood of inbreeding uh, when queen breeding and how to avoid it. Um, so what are the dangers? Well, the negative consequences could be really profound uh, because of the sexual determination mechanism in bees. You can get diploid male production, so obviously it's the bumblebee, but I've borrowed this slide from my lecture notes. Um, sex is determined in bees at a locus called the complementary sex determination locus. And usually if a female lays an unfertilized egg, you get a male. If you lay, uh, she lays fertilized eggs, you get females. But when, I'll have to gloss through this because I'm trying to catch back up with time, but basically when there's a match mating at this genetic region that determines sex, half of the worker force would be lost in a, in a bumblebee. Bumblebees only mate with one male to producing diploid males. So the queen can lay unfertilized eggs that produce males, fertilized eggs that produce females, but in the fertilized eggs where there's a match mating, they produce diploid males that are not viable. So that could be a really significant consequence. But Honeybees are highly polyandrous. They're drone comets. This is my impression of a drone comet. I imagine it looks like. Uh, they're drone congregation areas. And yesterday at the meeting, Anita, Dr. Anita Malhotra from Bangor University told us that she's done some modeling research that suggests that match mating is much less of a problem than might be imagined. And if you want to know about that, you could speak to Anita more maybe in the, in the break. Finally, what are the genetic basis of varroa resistance? Well, there are various uh, mechanisms that bees uh, show for resistance, grooming behavior, varroa sensitive hygiene, and suppressing the reproduction of reproductive mites. There are different techniques that geneticists can use to detect the genetic basis of those traits. There isn't time to explain how they work. Um, um, but the outcomes are there are genes like antimicrobial peptides, uh, gene regions on chromosome 9 and 5 that might be involved in the genetic basis of varroa resistance. However, quantitative geneticists can measure something called heritability that's a, a measure of how much of the phenotypic variants or the variants in the observable traits of an organism are due to uh, genetic effects in a population. The higher the heritability, the easier it is to breed that trait into a population. And the heritabilities are relatively low for these traits. The plain English summary is there's a strong environmental component to these traits that makes breeding them difficult. You could use gene-assisted selection technology in the future to uh, select favorable genes that individuals show and breed from them. And there are more modern studies that look at this by investigating gene expression. Studies like that typically find loads of genes that are differentially expressed between treatments. For example, colonies showing var varroa tolerance and those that don't. And then you need to validate the genes that are identified before they could be used in a breeding program. And then finally, I had a question about Snellgrove's genetic transmission list from 1946. This was a, a list of traits that bees were, uh, honeybees show, and Snellgrove was interested in the genetic transmission of these traits. I don't have access to Snellgrove's book, and I only managed to find a short preview of it in a Google search, and uh, I couldn't find any papers that cite Snellgrove's research. But what I can say is that Using the t same techniques that people use to investigate varroa resistance, you can investigate all kinds of other traits like honeybee foraging behavior, bee stinging behavior, body size, and so on. And using the modern advances in genetic technologies, it should make it gradually uh, more accessible over time to look at the genetic basis of the kinds of traits that you're interested in as beekeepers. Um, so Hello. Am I on? Can everyone hear me? Yeah, great. I can't hear myself. Um, uh, just quickly, um, also part of our research group that we, um, when all the academics got together yesterday to have a chat at Plymouth University, there's also Norman Carrick from Sussex University, who Mary was rushing through her talk and forgot to mention. So he's also here. Where is he? Stick your hand up. There he is. So we didn't forget you. It was just rushed through. Uh, so I'm Victoria Buswell. I'm a PhD student at Plymouth University working with Mary, John, and a postdoc researcher called Vanessa Hummel. And my PhD is about local adaptation in UK populations of dark European honeybee, so AMM, um, which is the bee that Andrew Brown is really interested in as well. So um, I'm at Plymouth University, but also I'm funded by NERC, and I'm in a partnership with B4. 
So that's the research team. Um, the research team at Plymouth, their expertise come from molecular ecology, so answering evolution, um, evolutionary and um, ecological questions using molecular techniques. That's where they're coming from. Um, unusually, I think we're the only scientists here today who aren't beekeepers. So we're coming straight from a, a science, uh, a scientific um, point of view. So, um, yeah, I'm based at Plymouth and um, we work with B4. And um, my PhD is called a uh, NERC case PhD studentship. So the Natural Environmental Research Councils are the government body that funds it. And case, it's a collaborative award. So the way it works is that um, it's academic and non-academic um, partnerships coming together to um, answer some questions. Um, so uh, they got funding for four years, and that began in autumn 2017, which is quite scary because I'm roughly halfway through now. Uh, which is slightly terrifying. But, um, so, a quick overview of the project. Um, how many beekeepers do I have in, actually? Get hands in the air, beekeepers. Okay, so yeah, the majority... <laughs> so the majority of the room are beekeepers, which is really good. So you're the people that I'd really like to speak to. Um, the overarching aim is to um, investigate the anecdotal claims that AMM has a suite of traits and characteristics that mean that it's better adapted to, um, for us specifically, to the UK climate. Um, though it is found and uh, well, uh, or the whole of sort of northern, northwestern Europe, I suppose. Yeah, sort of um, all the way that's in Sweden. It's uh, it's a lot of it's in um, the lowlands and stuff. So it's it's all over the uh, northwest of Europe. But I'm, uh, I'm particularly looking at um, populations in the southwest and further afield around the UK. Um, so that's the part I want to talk to you today. I'm also doing um, genetic analysis on, um, on these bees. But, um, and we want a range of bees. So if you're sitting in this room as a beekeeper and you think, actually, I can't be involved in this because I don't have AMM, I have some kind of hybrid, or I'm working with a local bee that we've just always kept in our group, um, I still really need you and want you to be involved in this project. It's really important that you don't feel um, sort of left out or marginalised by the fact this is about AMM because I need uh, I need to get a good picture of all the UK populations. Um, so there's two major tasks um, in my PhD. Um, the first thing is uh, there's the genotyping, so that's looking at uh, the genome of the bee. Um, and the other part is the phenotype, so I'm looking at those traits and characteristics, and that's where the beekeepers come in. So the genotyping, really quickly, I'm using a procedure called rad seeking, which um, I know John talked about a lot of different um, molecular approaches, and this is one where you look all over the genome, and I've tailored it so that I'm particularly interested in coding regions. So those are regions that actually will have an effect on... Uh, so they're things that code for genes that have an effect on that organism. Okay. But what I really want to speak to everyone today, uh, especially the beekeepers in the room, is about the beekeeping survey. So this is the way I'm going to get the phenotypic data, is by um, performing a, a citizen science project with beekeepers. So um, the way it works is that there's a beekeeper survey, and they will collect data on, um, on the traits and characteristics that um, we think that AMM have. Um, and it allows us to identify those Connollys that show those distinct differences. So, um, this is uh, quite an important bit. So, the survey runs over three years, and I'm in my second year. So, I did run... Oh, there we go. Um, so, I did, we're here, and I did run it last year, which I will speak about briefly. Um, but the most important thing the message to get out of today is that I, I really need your help. Um, it is a collaborative project and it's funded through the government knowing it's a collaborative project with B4. And B4 are partners in that and they signed up to that funding agreement. So it's really important for me to get um, beekeepers involved with the project. Um, so the beekeepers survey last year, <laughs> uh, I initially had 148 fours, so if they could do just one colony they could monitor for me, that's fine. A lot of them were doing two. Um, in case they lost one throughout the summer or it swarmed or something happened. It dropped to about 109 after the sort of first couple of months. Um, and then by the end of the summer, only 11 people managed to complete the survey. So it's quite a severe dropout rate. Um, and the problems, I, I, have, I have looked through it, and the, and the reasons I think these things happened is I think that the, 
I think it was too overwhelming. When they first look at the package, I think they looked at it and thought, there's no way I can do this um, as well as keep up with all my other beekeeping responsibilities. Because I think inherently the people who are interested in doing this kind of survey are also the people who are really involved in beekeeping. So they have a lot of other things going on, like queen rearing, or they're running groups, and they're helping people out. And I, so I think it was too overwhelming in the first place. I think each individual task was probably too onerous as well. Uh, so there were definitely things I could cut back on and uh, just make those easier, easier to complete. And, uh, and those tasks were too time-consuming as well. There was a major problem I had at one point, which was um, with communicating. So I had a, uh, I know this, it sounds like I'm blaming everything else, on, uh, but this is all me. I'm aware this is all me. So um, my email server thought I was sending spam because I was emailing too many people. So it blocked me. My server, blo uh, I don't know if it was the university or other servers, but basically I kept getting emails saying, you cannot send this email, you cannot send this email. And then if I'd send it individually or I'd send it from another account, it was working, but I couldn't do any mass emails at one point. So um, I had a few people come up to me saying, I did get in touch with you and you never got back to me. And that's a really big no-no, right? Because I, I really need people to be involved in this project. And it was down to a communication problem. The positive to take away from this whole area is that they're all problems I can solve. They're all things that I, I, can, I can go back to and change. I can change how overwhelming it is with a really good layout and a simple way of, of reading through the tasks so it doesn't look too complicated. I can get rid of tasks. I can make tasks easier. So they're all things that I can deal with. But ultimately, this uh, PhD project and this case, stu uh, this case studentship still needs a, a phenotypic data set to answer some of these questions. So um, I make it easier to do with uh, less time and less effort for individual casts, and I still want to answer some questions. So I've tailored it down to um, three things. So brood frame estimations. Um, the idea is you'd have a reference card that would tell you what 10% looks like, what 20% looks like, what 30% looks like. And you just simply tick which one you think that brood frame is. Uh, and you're counting drone brood, worker brood, and honey stores in the brood box. So the idea is that you just... I do have to make it simpler so that people aren't doing these full estimations, which is what they were doing last year. And because I'm not a beekeeper... Um, and actually, all the advice, can I just say, all the advice I got to design that original project was from beekeepers. So there's, a, there's kind of a, a difference between what they think they can do and what you actually, on day-to-day, -day, in day-to-day -day life, and your hobby as beekeepers, you're doing it in your free time, what you can actually do. So um, essentially, this is the big task, right? So we're doing brood estimations in the brood box. Temperament, which is just five-point sale, so you just give it one, two, three, four, or five. With a, there's a little description for each thing and the weather, so the rainfall and the temperature. And then that would be it. Do I have anyone here who, how long was it? Do I have anyone here who actually did the survey last year or attempted, even attempted the survey last year? Okay, so a few. Maggie finished it actually, you were one of, so in the corner, yay, you're one of them. <laughs> so um, I'm aware we're quite short on time because we're already sort of like almost an hour behind or something silly. It's not quite that bad, but it's quite bad. So what can I do to get more people to participate? I can make it as simple as possible, but I also need feedback. So I'm around for the entire day today, but um, I only had three people who were on the survey last year. I'm around for the entire day, so I'd really love it if people could come and speak to me about this. Um, it's really, really important. It, does anyone, did anyone do it and has any comments or ideas from last year? Can I open? No. Yes, Maggie. Yeah, that's dead. We're not doing that. <laughs> that was a terrible idea. <laughs> Sorry? <laughs> okay. <laughs> so you did mark, you marked them and they never came home. Right, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, it did tell you what your bees were doing, but it wasn't necessarily the um, aim of it. So that, that's one, uh, one of the tasks that's completely gone. But I am around for the rest of the day. Um, so some final thoughts. Obviously, it's uh, dark and non-dark bees will be subject to the survey, so it's really important. It doesn't matter what bees you have. Please come and speak to me and please be involved in the survey. Uh, what's in it for you? You'll get feedback um, to know where your bees sit in a UK population um, and uh, the general knowledge for... Um, for selective breeding will be greatly improved by um, 
a project like this. So it's one of those things that um, when Tim was speaking earlier about us actually digging in and doing something, this is a point where we can do something and we can answer those questions. And all those complicated questions that John got earlier that he was trying to answer, a lot of them were like, what about the gene for this and do we know about this and that? Well, this is a way we can, we can, we can do that but it means we need a large phenotypic data set because all those things like 23andMe, when you send it away and you say, oh, I've, um, I have this color hair or my parents are from this place, they have large data sets that they've built that on. And without those data sets, we can't answer those questions. So it's really important that we do this. Um, how to get involved. So there's my email that um, blocks me from everyone. But, um, <laughs> but I... It, um, what I would say is, uh, come and speak to me because I'm happy to give out, like, I'm on Twitter and Facebook and things like that, and I know they're not, but they work. And I'm on beekeeper groups and they work, and people speak to me through them as well. So um, do come and find me today. Um, so I just want to say that last year, yeah, it didn't work, but it doesn't mean it won't work. So, um, yeah, there are flyers upstairs, yeah, sorry. Um, so upstairs in the, um, in the gallery where the... Um, I can't think of the word for it. Exhibition is on. Um, there are flyers for this survey uh, on the side because there's some big, really cool um, pictures done by an electron scanning microscope of really close up pictures of bees. And they were done at Plymouth University. So there's, um, there's some flyers there for you to pick up. But um, yeah, please come and speak to me after. Um, and I think that's it for me. The question is uh, Dr. Mark Barnett from University, University of Edinburgh. Thank you very much. Okay. Hello. Am I? Is that good? Yeah. <clears throat> so I'd just like to thank the B4 project and, um, and Bibber for inviting me to speak at this uh, very inspirational place. Um, so the um, title of my talk is Using Whole Genome Sequencing to Analyse the Genetic Diversity and Health of the UK Honeybee Population. Um, so I work at the Roslyn Institute, which is situated a few miles south of Edinburgh in in Scotland. Um, in November, I've also been to bee school, and uh, so I got, I got my expert Scottish bee master in November, despite not being very Scottish. And I also, um, in January, I became president of Edinburgh of Midlothian Beekeepers Association, and I really hope I'm not the first English president they've had. So. So I've, I've been a beekeeper since 2010, and the beekeeping preceded the, the, the science I've been involved in, 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 in honeybee science. And just to briefly tell you about my beekeeping, um, I run, manage 18 colonies uh, in the Scottish borders. I keep those on seven sites, which makes, makes it quite a lot of work for me. Um, I have 12 static colonies, and then I have six colonies that I take to, we have a lot of, quite a lot of east oil seed rape on the eastern side of uh, Scotland in the borders and they also take those bees to trees with, um, sites with a lot of lime trees and um, also um, in Scotland obviously we take our um, hives up to the heather in August. So in 2015, uh, we established an apiary um, at the Easterbush campus. That's the campus where the Roslyn Institute is situated. It was, we, we, we built the apiary mainly to support research activities. Um, usually, it usually, it's not a very large apiary. It usually holds about six or seven colonies. However, in, in 2016, um, it widened its remit and um, there was a lot of interest in us getting to pra practice beekeeping on campus for staff and students. So we've run a three-day intensive course um, through Edin Ed Edin Edinburgh Midlothian and Beekeepers Association for the last three years. And we've also um, been encouraging people to do their beekeeping exams, and we've had ten basic beekeeping certificates and uh, one module, one so far. Um, we like to think it helps well-being on campus. Um, people come back from the A3 normally with a smile on their face, um, unless they've been stung. Um, and we also like to like to think it enhances pollination, and ho hopefully we're not having a negative impact on some of the other pollinators on campus. 2018 in Scotland um, was a was a really good year. Um, I, I made lots of honey. Um, normally we have terrible, terrible Julys um, in, in, in the last 
you know, nine, eight years I've been beekeeping. I thought that this was quite exceptional. Um, and um, so we uh, made quite a lot of honey on campus, um, you know, despite the fact that the apiary is not run as any kind of efficient honey making operation. It's basically just for people to come and have a go. So, um, so not all honeybees are the same in Europe, and um, different subspecies have evolved to different environments. And, so, and these different subspecies can be identified by differences in their DNA and their genetic diversity. And so the map shows the distribution of the subspecies um, before the, a lot of the importations in the 20th century. So we've got, um, oh, it's not that one, it's that one. Yeah, so we've got Apis mellifera mellifera, the, the dark bee in um, Western Northern Europe. We've got Apis mellifera ligustica, the yellow bee in Italy. And we've got Apis mellifera carnica, the grey bee, which is from Austria and former Yugoslavia. And if we're talking about Apis mellifera mellifera, we describe it as, as being descended from the M lineage, whereas um, Ligustica and Carnica are from the C lineage, and so those two bees are more closely related, the uh, Ligustica and Carnica genetically. And there's also a lot of genetic diversity within a colony. Um, so the queen, um, so the queen will mate with an average of um, 12 to 13 drones, I think, is the average. And so, and that, what that does is it um, gives you quite a lot of genetic diversity within the hive. And if you think about it, the queen goes out of her way and puts herself at a, quite a lot of risk to, 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 to um, obtain that amount of uh, genetic diversity. I can't believe I've used the word impact <laughs> after what um, Tim said, but um, there it is. We could, we could call it effects of diversity. Um, so, um, so the basic results of these differences, the, 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 DNA, the, the DNA of these different subspecies of bees, that there's going to be, there might be different disease resistances, and there'll, there'll be differences in the behaviour that um, new beekeepers know about, difference in brood production, swarming tendency, um, different temperaments, probably also got a genetic element, and there's and obviously a lot of the other things that we can measure about the behaviour in bees. But um, the main point is that there's, there's quite little known, really, about the DNA regions that underpin this. So really, you know, honeybee science, we're, we're quite a long way behind. The Rosen Institute is, a, is an animal bioscience, and they know a lot more about sheep and pigs and cows and chickens than, than we do about honeybees. Anyway, DNA sequencing will help with this. So just to remind us about the structure of DNA... So what we've got here is DNA as a repeating structure. We've got that sort of turquoise sugar, um, a red phosphate and a base. And um, so that base cytosine is always bound to guanine and adenine is always bound to thymine. And so that's basically your genetic code. So everything's coded into, into this sequence of bases. And um, there's also a directionality to the molecule. So if you notice that the, the sugars on the left are all pointing upwards and the sugars on the right are all pointing downwards, so there is a, there's a directionality into those two strands. So the information is, has a direction, directionality to it. Um, and when we, so when we talk about a genome, we're basically talking about all of the DNA in the organism, and that's going to be called all the genes that are expressed. So it's got all the information needed to build and maintain an organism. So if we know that information about a dark bee, we know what a dark bee is. Um, and it's contained in all cells that have a nucleus. So the kind of genetic variation you get if you, when you're looking at these um, different subspecies, well, this is an example of scientists like to make words up. Well, we have to make words up sometimes. So this word, indels, which you, you wouldn't probably understand if you came across it, but what basically we've come up with a word for this, well, this bee at the top has got a sequence. We're just looking at one of the strands here, but you can see those, those um, green labeled row of seven bases in the, in, in, in the middle. So the, one, the, one, the bee in the middle has, has had three bases deleted from it, so that's a deletion, and the one at the bottom has had 
they see it inserted. And so we remain the word for insertion and deletion called an indent. Uh, another example, um, and, a, and a more common form of genetic variation that you would find within those um, honeybees, between those honeybee subspecies, would be what we call small nucleotide polymorphism. And so the bee on the left, you see we've got an A bound to a T, and that's changed in the B on the right to a T to a C. And that's an example of a small nucleotide polymorphism for one base pair difference. And there's quite a lot of those. There might be one of those every 50 base pairs in the B genome. And um, so our laboratory and several others across Europe, um, including uh, Grace McCormack's uh, laboratory in Galway, um, we're involved in a collaboration led by uh, Apparently I'm too hairy, that's what the problem is. <laughs> <coughs> so, <laughs> so a collaboration led by um, Alice Pinto from Portugal, and um, what she developed is basically a low, a low cost genotyping platform, and this was designed to identify M lineage from C lineage, so quite useful for identifying black bees. And what she did was she carefully selected from a pool of these SNPs, these one base pair differences, and she picked um, 117, and what she picked was the ones that were most different between the M lineage and the C lineage, so most different between black bees, and the yellow bees, and grey bees. So you wouldn't want to use this, if you, want, if you wanted to look at the difference between the Irish black bee and the Scottish black bee, then you're probably not going to see any difference, because you're not going to find that variation. That, the variation is what determines between a the most different ones between those two lineages. It costs about £14 per sample. That doesn't include um, the DNA, the cost of making the DNA. Um, and then you would put, um, so I, we submitted 96 samples from the UK, and that included some samples from the B4 project. Um, this shows the location of the colonies sampled. So the blue dots show um, Apis mellifera and mellifera, or suspected Apis mellifera and mellifera colonies, um, red buckfast, yellow carnica, and green ligustica. And the, you'll see there's some with a star on, and they're from protected sites. So there's like protected sites like the, like the island of Colonsey uh, up there on the west coast of Scotland. There's a protected site um, by the Scottish government. And then we've also got, there's also protected sites, in, there's a protected site there in France. So, and then, so, admixture, the, re the result of breeding between two or more previously isolated populations within a species. So, Alice Pinto's group used um, a computer program called Admixture to analyse the proportion of the genetic backgrounds using that information from this genotyping platform. And when you, when you run this program, you can assume different numbers of genetic backgrounds, and then you see which one is the most likely. So in this case, we're splitting this, you know, M from C um, in a very sort of by way. Then we've got two, we've the most likely, obviously, two backgrounds. And I've, I've, I'm, I'm showing this graphically on the right, so I can explain the next, um, the, the, the complete result. But so if we have a look at this, um, so this B here on the left. So we're saying here that when we've done, when we've done the run this, we've run the, 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 the genetic variants, the 117 SNPs through the computer. And we've got, we're saying, it's got a blue bar, and we're saying there's 100% probability it's AMM. And then this one over here on the right is a Ligustica or Carnica, a C lineage, and we're saying that's 100% chance that's a C lineage. And then with some varying hybrids in the middle. And if you put all those bars together for all um, 431 samples across Europe, and then and you order them by country, and you put the the blackest ones, the ones with the most AMM genetics, to the left, and the ones with the least to the right of the country, then you'll form. So that's basically a load of those colours joined together. And so the thing, 
where there's coloured columns. And so you, you can note that we've got a lot of, lot of black bees there in Ireland, in fact, a lot of northern European countries. And um, the, one, the, the samples from the black um, B4 project uh, are, are there, right at the left hand of left hand side of England. So you see there's a few high proportion um, probability that they're good examples of um, the black bee. And um, that, that work was published last June in, in the journal Scientific Reports. So as Jonathan was saying, um, whole genome sequencing has, has decreased massively, um, certainly in the lifetime that I've been in science. Um, in fact, it, John, on Jonathan's first slide, I actually started at the left-hand side <laughs> and I've ended up at the right-hand side. So I started off doing Sanger sequencing in the early 1990s, so I ran these big gels. We used to pour these big gels and then we'd run the DNA sequencing on it and then you'd end up it was radioactively labelled and you'd transfer it to a photographic plate and you'd be able to read up the DNA bases. And I think, I think then I'd probably be lucky if I got 500 bases a day. That would be probably my, what I was doing. And now you can, you know, you can um, sequence billions of, billions of uh, bases a day. So, um, as Jonathan said, the Human Genome Project took 11 years and cost $3 billion to do. A lot of money. It now costs a lot less than that and it takes about three days to, to do the sequencing. And the good news about honeybee, the honeybee is the genome is the tenth, a tenth the size of the, um, of the human genome at 250 million bases. And um, it seems to be when we've been asking for put, getting quotes in, you know, it's coming down to around about you know, 120 pounds a sample. So it really is getting uh, you know, within our reach. So... So um, it, would have been, it would have been nice to, um, have been to say we've um, made recent progress on a whole genome sequencing, but um, um, since I spoke here last time, we haven't managed to do any more. Um, but so what we have done is we've done, um, and the science, when we had the scientists meeting um, yesterday, everybody agreed that it would be a really good idea. And what we need to do is basically sequence the UK population. So we've performed a pilot um, to, and basically what we did for that pilot is we sampled from 19 hives um, colonies across Britain. We isolated for those, each sample was um, we, a, pool, a pool of 16 workers, so we took the DNA from, from 16 worker bees. Um, the samples, we sampled workers from, the colon, uh, from a colony queen. Um, Three good examples that we got from Ferrer, um, of good examples of AMM from England, um, an AMM breeding project. Um, we sampled a carniolan and a buckfast that had been recently imported into the Scottish population, and, and 12 random Scottish samples. So to do your whole genome sequencing, basically what you do is, so you get to, I would um, extract DNA from my samples, and I would hand it over to my, the, the Edinburgh Genomics um, facility, the genomics company, and they would break that DNA into equal sizes um, of 550 bases. Because that's what you need to do if you're going to sequence it by massively, what they call massively parallel sequencing. And so, and what you get when you, so when you sequence it, is you'll get a, what we'll call a sequencing read, which is that yellow that red, the red arrow, which is 125 bases in on that fragment from one end and 125 bases in from the other end. And what, and what you know is that those two sequencing reads came from that particular fragment. And so what you'll get is a load of a load, millions and millions of fragments. And then what you do then is you al align them to the reference genome. and then look for the genetic variation. So we look for the genetic variation between those 19 samples and against the reference. And what we found was, we found, so I'm now calling, I'm calling that small nucleotide polymorphism, now I'm calling it a small nucleotide variant. It's basically the same thing, but I've got to keep the scientists happy. So um, it's, and that's, that's to do with, the reason that's, called an, um, a variant is that we've not established its frequency in the population. So it, 
and, and to be a, called a polymorphism, then we would have to know that it was more than one percent of the um, of the, po in the in the population. Okay, so so of those small nucleotide variants, we got nearly four million. We got about uh, just over 800,000 of inserts and nearly a million deletions. And then we compared all of that information in a, um, in a similarity network. So we're basically comparing all of that genetic information in this graph. The, the spheres, um, the balls, are, um, represent the colonies and so the Thick, the um, thicker the lines between those colonies, the more similar they are. So what we can see is that there's a lot of the Scottish bee, the Scottish random Scottish samples are very um, s similar genetically to the colonsy um, black bee. But interestingly, the good examples of AMM we got from England um, are, are less good examples and are more hybridised. The carniolin and the buckfast are not are not connected to the graph because they're because they're very different. And if they were connected to the graph, and we, we lowered the um, amount of similarity for it to connect to the graph, they'd probably be over here somewhere. So, <clears throat> so when you sequence the bees, you don't just get the bees' DNA; you get everything else within the bee. And um, interestingly, so you get the bee's microbiome. And there's a, there is an exhibition on the human microbiome um, just outside this room. And um, so I can, uh, I, I wish I read the quote. And the quote is, um, on the microbiome, is the totality of microorganisms and their collective genetic material present in or on the body, which was um, Joseph Lederberg in 2001. And this, um, this work was done by a colleague of mine, um, Tim Regan at Roslyn. So he, so he, he analysed the, the sequencing reads that didn't line up to the bee genome. So we basically took all these reads and then he, he had to analyse the, the non-bee sequence reads, which was quite a jigsaw puzzle. And this is how he did it. Um, so basically, so we're talking about sequencing reads and what we're talking about is that we're basically talking about 125 GCAT letters in a computer. So he, he assembled those reads into much longer reads, and we call those contigs. So they were, and he got 35, over 35,000 of these long things. And, he, and the reason they, they assemble is because of the similarity between the reads, so you can build them up into these bigger, long sequencing reads. And then what he did was he, he basically aligned those, the reads for each sample, so if you remember all our samples from, all, from our bee colonies, and he aligned those reads to the, con, to the contig, the big piece of DNA. And so if you do that, if you see, so if you see that graph there, so we're, we're aligning the sequencing reads for each sample, which is along um, the axis at the bottom, the x-axis. So you can see that some of the samples have got more reads and some of them have got less. So whatever this is, then that there's more in certain samples than others. And we f the way we find out what it, what it is, is we then we compare the, con the contig to databases. There's a lot of information out there in the databases. And so, and if you want to look at, um, you know, those 35,000 of those graphs, yeah, that's quite a lot of information. Um, so what we do is we make another graph. So each of the little um, spots on that graph there on the right, um, they're all contigs, and that they're and they're being um, the relationship between each other is on the basis of the shape of those graphs on the so the amount of reads that were in that these graphs here shown on the right. So for example, for this um, species we've identified. Um, Bartonella apis. Um, we've got um, we've got a, 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 the, a, the re, um, numbers of reeds in certain colonies like that, and um, and that's and all of those are located in that cluster. 
um, of context there. And so basically it, it enables us to identify what's, what's in the bee's microbiome and we've identified, so we've identified a lot of the, um, a lot of the microorganisms. So we, we've got a lot of lactobacilli, um, we've got um, Snodgrassella alvi, Gillimella opicola. We've also detected some known pathogens um, Nosema apis and Nosema serrani are both there. Um, Ascospheria apis, the causative um, agent for the chalk brood fungus. And um, also uh, Lotmeria passim is a, is a unicellular organism um, called a trypanosome. And, um, and we published the, the, that work on the, um, on the genetic diversity and the microbiome in um, a paper in Nature Communications in, in November, um, just last November. So, I've nearly, I've nearly finished. <clears throat> so most recently, uh, we've been working on um, something called a single cell gene expression atlas. And so it's now possible um, to do sing sequencing from single cells and what we're going to be talking about here is sequencing RNA. So we're not sequencing DNA now, we're sequencing RNA. So um, just back to some basic science, but so DNA is located in the nucleus of the cell, and when genes are expressed, they're converted into an intermediary mo molecule called messenger RNA, and then that's exported from the cell, and that goes out into the cytoplasm where it's made into protein. So what we did was we, we took our we take our tissue and we break it down into single cells and we then we do RNA sequencing this time and so, um, so we look at the, ex so we, get to, we get the expression of, a, of a thousands of genes in each of these cells and then the challenge is to work out what those cells are and so and, and we've, been, we've been performing some pilot studies of um, honeybee cell diversity and this, so this is the pilot experiment we did, and what we took, we took, um, that's a, a pre-pupa, day 10 on the left, and a, that's a day 15 pupa on the right, and we dissoci dissociated those into single cells. We then sequenced the mRNA and then analyzed it. And so, another graph. Um, so each of those spheres is, a single, is one of those cells, and its relationship in the graph is based on the genes it's expressing. And then we've, and we've basically then clustered the graph and identified different cell populations. So here, if we see here, we've got um, the fat body. We've got a lot of cells from the fat body. And interestingly, we seem to have different, slightly different cells in the pre-pupa than in the, in, in the, in the, in the later pupa. Um, we've also, we also identified quite a number of um, different types of brain cells, and we've got, um, we managed to identify flight muscle and body muscle, um, cuticle, and quite a few elements of cells from the um, digestive system. <clears throat> 